Hello everyone. Hello. Good morning. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today and I'm amazed as well because two years ago I didn't even know what ME-CFS was. But last year I couldn't even move my head off the pillow. And today I'm here sharing my story with you. I'm still not very well so please bear with me. Um, but I would like to talk to you about my experience and also uh, something that I'm passionate about, and that is education. So I'm actually going to share my story with you as a sort of medical case presentation, and then move on to a few thoughts towards the collaborative event here today about education, uh, particularly in terms of educating medical students and also in educating health professionals. So, uh, thank you very much for your wonderful introduction. Uh, my job at the moment is an NHS doctor working in dermatology surgery. So I basically cut out skin cancers. And before I got sick, I was doing roughly a thousand procedures per year for the NHS. I trained in Oxford and was fortunate to have a lot of exposure to scientific research approaches. I've spent six years working all around London in surgical jobs, mainly plastic surgery, which has helped incredibly with my current day job. I have a master's degree in education. I've co-written a couple of medical textbooks. And I really do enjoy teaching and training juniors. And as part of that, when I moved across from plastic surgery to dermatology, I took a postgraduate diploma in dermatology, which I now tutor on for Cardiff, and I've done that for the last three years. In September 2016, I was completely well, and then was struck by a series of quite severe viral infections, sore throats, high temperatures, fevers. In a matter of weeks, I dropped my capacity from 100% normal to about 30% of normal. And yet I carried on trying to do my full-time job, looking after my two young children, tried to carry on my social life. <laughs> and I really got sicker and sicker and sicker to the point where I was functioning at about 5% of normal. I couldn't read, I couldn't watch TV. I was extremely sick. Not only was I feeling flu-like and unwell, but I was experiencing headaches, facial pain, muscle twi twitching, awful joint pains. I thought, oh gosh, this is how arthritis must feel. Change in bowel habit, flu-like symptoms, and given that I was so fit and well before, it was a real shock to me that I was occasionally having to climb the stairs on my hands and knees, and I was really struggling to walk more than a few hundred yards. So this is my life. Many of these photos were taken in the months before I got sick. I have a wonderful um, countryside near where I live. That's the bottom left hand corner if you can see it. I have a five mile run that I used to do regularly a couple of times a week around the local um, fields. I cycle, I do gardening. I've got my education diploma. You know, I'm a really busy, active person. I love my life. I love my job. And I was fit and well before I got this ill. Well, I say I was fit and well, but actually, looking back, when I used to get infections when I was younger, I would go really downhill very quickly. And in fact, ended up hospitalised for five days with pyelonephritis following a urine infection. As a junior doctor, I had a DNV uh, vomiting bug that put me in hospital for three days with neutropene sepsis. All my colleagues were very worried about me. When I had acute appendicitis, even though my appendix hadn't burst, my abdomen was full of fluid and they gave me IV antibiotics, which isn't always the case with acute appendicitis. Um, I had pneumonia, which put me in hospital twice uh, for the same event. 
and then this mystery virus that triggered my ME in September 2016 later turned out to be the glandular fever Epstein-Barr virus. I don't take any regular medications, I don't have any allergies, I've got a wonderful supportive home life, my husband has been incredible throughout this, I've got lovely children and I was fit and well beforehand. My parents have really helped me through this and when my mum saw me week after week deteriorating, literally going down the drain, she was horrified but she also felt that what she was seeing was a repetition of history and her mother had also had several viruses in her early 30s and deteriorated and deteriorated and she died and we've seen the 1958 hospital notes and we are sure that she died of ME CFS. So I've got this wonderful family history, my maternal aunt had it as well and two of my cousins probably have it. Further symptoms, literally I would sound like a hypochondriac if I went and talked to the doctor everything, chest pain, shortness of breath, abdominal pains, intolerance to light and sound, intolerance to heat and cold, tinnitus, dry eyes, particularly at night. I, when I first really started going downhill, I thought I had a brain tumour because I couldn't even think of words. I was saying the wrong word, I was falling about, I had a memory of a goldfish, I couldn't multitask. It was really, really detrimental to how I could function and I couldn't do my job and I couldn't look after my children and I couldn't really function at all. I also had, bizarrely, and that's where allergies come in, a new allergic reaction. I had blisters on my finger where my wedding band is and that's actually stopped now but for six months I was getting horrendous blistering of my skin as a reaction to my my wedding ring, and I'd been married for 10 years, so that was new. As is the story with most patients, blood tests, nothing really significant there, nothing to find. They did pick up the Epstein-Barr virus, the glandular fever, they did pick up that I had cytomegalovirus, and they did pick up that I had various other bacterial infections going on in my sputum. I had CT scan, MRI scan, echo, and the only test that picked up anything was the cheapest one of them all, the lying and standing heart rate, which actually was done by a nurse, and she picked up that I had postural tachycardia. As a doctor, and particularly as a surgeon who likes to have answers, I went one step further and I actually privately arranged to have my ATP profile done by John McLaren Howard uh, in Devon and my score was very low so this was a paper that came out in 2009 normal controls um, have a mitochondrial energy score Dr Myhill's drawn that up in her paper between one and two and then she's plotted the severity of illness and she's compared it with the mitochondrial ATP score and what she found was that the more severe the patient the, the lower the score and my score was sort of amongst the severe and very severe. The picture at the top in the middle is me on the day that I went. That was a good day because I was able to travel on the train to go and get the blood test. Um, but there were other days where I really couldn't move. And this slide is to show you the impact, not only on the individual and their life, but also the people around them. So my parents should be gallivanting around the world and enjoying their retirement, but instead they were nursing me at their house because I was too ill to live in the same house as my two young children. There was a lot of pain. I was in absolute agony that day. It was my mum's birthday. We tried to take me out, had to wrap me up in blankets and coats in the wheelchair. And the, uh, the rest of the impact, we've had to get a full-time nanny. 
My husband has a high power job in central London. He has had to do so much to support me. It's not just me, it's all the people around me that have been affected. And someone has had to be flown in to do my job for the NHS from Rome, plastic surgeon, <laughs> to cut out the skin cancers that I was supposed to be cutting out. I was one of the lucky ones, so I saw 13 different doctors before I got a diagnosis. And <laughs> finally, after about five minutes, my current GP said, oh, I know exactly what you've got. You've got MECFS. I said, do you believe in it? She said, yes. <laughs> I've got two other patients, they're very severe, and now I believe in it. And the mainstay of management for me was rest, antivirals, and B12 injections. After five months, I more than doubled my energy levels. So, by sharing my story, I hope I can also share what I learned from the experience, and that is that MECFS is a serious condition which leaves the sufferer functioning at a fraction of their pre-illness level. It is not psychological. I wasn't taught about MECFS at medical school, and I don't know what's happened in the last 18 years in terms of advancement in teaching, and that's part of my next part of the discussion. But a lot of doctors don't even believe in the condition. And the current guidelines, when I first looked at the NICE guidelines, I thought, well, that's not what I've got. It doesn't even fit with, with what I'm experiencing. So there needs to be a big change with the NICE guidelines as well going forward. So education, this is a big job. <laughs> However, we're in a period of transition, and I think that prior to sort of two years ago, MECFS wasn't on people's radars. They weren't even thinking of it. And now we're going from that unknown unknown, we don't know about it, we don't even know we don't know about it, to this known unknown. So we know that there's lots of questions to be asked now but we're starting to get the idea that this is an important biomedical illness. And that's where this revolution in thinking comes. I've seen it myself um, in stomach ulcers. They used to be treated surgically with vagotomies. They're now treated medically with antacids. And I think there needs to be a real revolution in thinking from the biopsychosocial to a biomedical idea. And here we go. We're, we're realising we don't know <laughs> about it. I was thrilled to see this article a couple of months ago in the uh, sports section of the British Medical Journal saying that 90% of cases aren't being recognised. Well, the fact that we're recognising that we're not recognising the disease is, is a really good step. Doctors, or certainly my generation of doctors, were taught about illnesses such as HIV and MS. And in the last 20 years, there's been an incredible rate of progression um, in terms of the quality of life of these patients and people now being diagnosed. They've got an extremely good near-normal life expectancy. And in HIV, there are more than 20 drugs now on the market. MS, there's more than a dozen. So there's a real sort of push forward about the things we know. And now we need to sort of follow that up. Is it 250,000 cases or is it maybe more? Quality of life. The wonderful group at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine have looked at this and they have shown that the quality of life is poorer for people with MECFS. And the question, life expectancy. Well, it would be nice to know. We need to know. We need to find out. And hopefully, again, some research will be telling us. But there was a small study in the States a couple of years ago which estimates that it's significantly lower. And that's because we've been left behind the curve of progression. 
I love this slide and I'll just quickly talk you through it because it paints a really important picture about what doctors need to learn about what they see and how that compares to what the patient is feeling and how the patient feels after they've seen them and gone home and collapsed in bed. So this is a study published last year by Cook who's done over a decade of research on chronic fatigue. Um, patients and controls were asked maths questions and they looked at the number of errors in their mental arithmetic and in the first four and a half minute session patients and controls performed almost identically. Then they repeated it half a minute later and then they repeated it again and the controls who, was, who were the dark bars they got better and better, they made less and less errors, whereas the ME patients got worse and worse. The first three trials were just straight off. The second three trials were after 25 minutes on a static bicycle at 70% of maximal heart rate. So not really pushing it, but getting some exercise. For the controls, that was great. Blood flowing to the brain, they got better at the mental arithmetic. The ME patients, it was a disaster. And they know that they can't perform after exercise, but it's very difficult for them to try and explain that in their 10-minute consultation with the GP. So what am I doing about um, education? <laughs> I'm thrilled that there are some medical students here, and I hope over the next two days you come and talk to me. Um, I've approached the Medical Schools Council because I want to know what's being taught now, this yet next academic year and in the next two weeks. We're, the Medical Schools Council have given me the green light to send out a survey to all the 34 medical schools UK-wide to find out what is the current delivery of MECFS teaching in the UK. And I'm going to ask them a series of quick questions through SurveyMonkey about whether they include formal teaching, whether they examine on the subject, because nothing gets a student to learn something like an exam. Details of the teaching provided. I want to see what slides they're using or how, what the interface is, whether they're having actual patients involved in the teaching. Details of the individuals. Is this still being taught by psychologists or are we moving into an area of neurologists and immunologists? And finally, I want to know how they would feel about receiving <coughs> some centralised sort of teaching recommendations from us, in, usually in the sort of context of e-learning. As part of this, I'm also doing a pilot trial at Cardiff University, so I've, I've been taken up as the project lead by the Dean of Cardiff to try out a few things. E-learning, using a platform like FutureLearn, a lecture, special study modules for individual students to approach me for little projects, small group work, and involving the, the two Welsh charities, I've got a lot of patient volunteers. And once we've done that over the 2018-19 academic year, we can go back to the Medical Schools Council and talk about how we're going to launch that UK-wide and offer it to all the medical schools in the UK. <coughs> My title says Educating Doctors, but I've had a lot of blue sky thoughts about this. And the real workforce of people who are currently looking after our patients are not only the friends and relatives, but there are a lot of nurses, there are a lot of dieticians, there are a lot of home tutors for education. And I think that we need to tap into that structure because really we are very much behind uh, in terms of compared to HIV and MS, which I used earlier in terms of infrastructure to support doctors caring for patients with ME-CFS. So the therapists, who are a lot of the workforce here, need to be included in this educational drive. Many doctors and therapists are seeking extra qualifications in response to patient demand. 
Uh, this is something I've observed uh, both in plastic surgery and dermatology. But also a lot of therapists wanting to set up private work are looking for sort of degrees and postgraduate certificates on their CV. And I came up with this wonderful idea that wouldn't it be nice if patients UK-wide could request to be seen by someone who is MECFS qualified. I think this is my final part of contribution to the collaboration and it's the idea that we actually develop a proper qualification in the biomedical science of ME, CFS. And that we support our professionals through a, through a body not unlike this. And we offer our members regular continued professional development because we're accelerating at such a rate mm -hmm. and I can't wait to learn all of the new things in the next part of the conference and please approach me if you have any ideas for collaboration and learning. Thank you.